Hey, what's up guys? TK here. Uh, welcome to Founders Unscripted. We're gonna go see uh, the CEO of Jump Cut and we're gonna get an office tour of their HQ. So let's go. So Kong is CEO of Jump Cut and I'm about to go meet him and he's gonna give a tour. Uh, he's running a 100 person company. They're doing over 12 million in revenue. So let's go check out his space. Hey, what's up, Carl? Hey, what's up, man? Good to see you. Yeah? Good to see you, too. All right. Welcome, so, welcome. This is the Jump Cut office, and um, as you can see, bad ideas are welcome here. These are the legal drugs that we give uh, our employees. <laughs> Coffee. Very necessary for productivity. I love the And product. this is the illegal drugs. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I think this is tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, we're in California. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's true. That's like, if that was me, that's legal here. Uh, these are the games that we play. Um, if you ever play, not Spyfall, there's another one. We have uh, Coup and Resistance here somewhere. Mm. If you ever play that with me, I get very, very crazy and competitive. So, that and Monopoly. So what we got over here? Yeah, so this is the wall that um, we put pictures of our recent projects, us having fun. Um, here we are doing yoga with some of our most successful students. They're all, wow. they all went super viral and are making a ton of money. And then this is actually a picture of our, uh, one of our employees. She did a, she was, she acted in a movie. We donated to that movie and then we, we got a signed autographed picture of her in exchange for our donation. <laughs> this wall over here is very special. Um, you get to be immortalized on this wall if you work here for a year. So what we do is we have this company that takes a picture of you and then puts it into a painting of any type of photo or like renaissance <laughs> painting that you want. And these are all hand painted by the way. So cool. So mine, I just picked some like random like uh, knight. And then here you can see Matt, he put it himself on Van Gogh or Van Gogh if you're from uh, you want to pronounce it really, really correctly. Um, there's one missing here because this was our uh, director of marketing who recently left, unfortunately, to uh, start his own company. So there's one missing. And uh, this right here is two chains. We just have this because. <laughs> Check it out. It's where all the magic happens. We're going to see behind the scenes production. So this is actually where all the magic happens. Uh, it looks extremely messy, which it's always messy because we're always filming something. But all you need to do is look at this part mm, right here. I see. Yeah. So when you watch one of our courses, this is what you see. You don't understand. You don't realize that there's a bunch of shit going on in the background. This is where Kong sits down, right? Yep. Talks to the camera. That's it. Right. Okay. Let's move on. So this right here is our mural. We only had to give up five percent equity for somebody to paint this. <laughs> You know, they say Google, like when they first started, they were actually giving equity to the people that were doing the massages and the murals. Oh my gosh, yeah. They all did. became millionaires. Yeah, we didn't really do that. We got this done for a thousand bucks. Open floor. I think they can really sit anywhere they want, but um, I sit over here. Okay. Yeah. Is the desk of the CEO, Kong? I'm gonna fan just in case I get hot sometimes. <laughs> Here's another meeting room. We wanted to have uh, some paper planes just to remind you of the good old days when you're like in kindergarten or first grade, you know? Because we're an education company, so wanted it to make it feel like a school somewhat. Here are the uh, conjoined triangles of success. Uh, if you know what this is, then you're in the loop. I've never even actually seen that. Oh, the compromise. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's, um, you have to choose two. You know, it's a secret. I'm not gonna tell you what the secret is to this. <laughs> Next time. Yeah. I like to call this our acid room. Um, there's usually bean bags in here. Where are the bean bags? Oh, yeah. The bean, bean bag. Bags. The bean bags are over here. But we actually moved those bean bags out because we're gonna film. You guys are gonna film this filming here. So we set it all up for you. Everything's almost ready to go. But um, yeah, we made this a little bit more. You know psychedelic to get the creative juices flowing. Oh, that is cool. Yeah, and then we put bean bags in here to make it not so monotonous, because you sit on chairs all day, you know, sometimes you come yeah. in here, do a meeting on a bean bag, and it feels a little bit more fresh. 
So this is a phone booth. Um, we have some more up here. We realized that when you're taking a phone call, you don't want to take a phone reading you, right? Yeah. So instead, you go into the phone booth, and these are soundproof, so if you talk shit about somebody else, they can't hear you. <laughs> hey, Kong, man. I can't hear you, man. Yeah. See, I just called you a douchebag, and you didn't hear it. Pretty good. Room? Huh? A little plug there if you want to get a phone booth. How much do these run? Three, four thousand? Three thousand. Three thousand. Yeah. Three thousand. Yeah. That is a wrap, guys. Check out the interview. Hey, what's up? TK here and welcome to another episode of Founders Unscripted. And I've got my boy uh, Kong Fam here um, and we're going to go jump right into it, Kong. What's up, Kong? How's Appreciate going? it. Thank you. For doing the show. Um, let's go in and just kind of start off with you introducing to our audience your, your quick bio or life uh, history up to the point of starting Jump Cut. How far do you want me to go? <laughs> um, let's go back um, maybe... Maybe to your high school years and, and kind of work up from there. Got it. Um, so, yeah, my name's Kong Pham. I'm the CEO of Jump Cuts. And we uh, are creating a school for entrepreneurs. So the way that I got into this was, actually, I'll start even before that. So my dad, before I was even born, my dad was in the Vietnam War, right? And um, he was fighting alongside the U.S. And when that, that happened and we lost, he became a prisoner of war for about eight years, nine years, eating nothing but like rice, potatoes, Whoa. and salt. And so um, when he got out, you know, uh, married my mom, had me, and we he essentially won a lottery to come to the U.S. There was this program they were doing where they would take, you know, uh, soldiers that were in the war and bring them to the U.S. and give them a green card. Mm. And so the reason I, I you know, this story has affected me a lot is because my dad throughout my whole life has told me, look, we're growing up poor because, you know, we did. We grew up in Section 8 housing and um, uh, we were always very poor. My, my parents had to work multiple shifts. Um, he would always say, even though we're poor, it looks bad compared to everybody else. Mm. But you don't know what I went through. Right. And so, one, you don't know what I went through. That's bad. Number one. And two, like, don't take this for granted. We're very lucky to be here. We're very fortunate to be here. And you have all of this opportunity in front of you. So I always grew that, grew up with that in mind. And um, I always tried to, you know, seize the day, take advantage of, of uh, any kind of loophole or situation that I can find. And so because we grew up poor, I was always an entrepreneur at heart. Uh, my first business was selling bootleg CDs when <laughs> CD burners just came out. And I, uh, you know, sold for five bucks. This is, you know, sold for five bucks, and uh, the, the the store was sold, selling it for like twenty dollars. And so I was making money off of that. I did this basically my whole life, essentially, not CDs, but a lot of different businesses yep. that that I started just to pay for the things that I couldn't get, the things that my parents couldn't couldn't buy for me, like a Razer scooter at the time, or, mm. or like a N sixty four, or whatever the new game system was. So um, that really developed, that, that really got me very interested in entrepreneurship. So going back to the high school days, um, I wanted to be a doctor because that's what my family told me to yeah. do. That's like the prestigious thing to do. Doctor or lawyer. Yeah, doctor or lawyer <laughs> or dentist. And so my senior year of high school, I said, you know what? Fuck it. I don't want to be a, like, I don't want to go to medical school. I hate mm -hmm. school. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start my own business. And so I went to college uh, for business. You know, I got a business degree with a, uh, or I was trying to get a business degree with a uh, concentration in entrepreneurship. Mm. And I didn't learn anything. You know, this was a few years in and I was $50,000 in debt. Wow. I learned nothing about the world of business, nothing about entrepreneurship, just a lot of useless classes that were not applicable to the real world. And so um, throughout that time, I tried to drop out <laughs> multiple times to start mm -hmm. different things. Um, but the time that it works was my last, in my last semester of college, I started a YouTube channel. And this YouTube channel kind of took off. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to school anymore. I'm going to do this full time. I see. Yeah. Well, what was that channel called? It was called Simple Pickup. Simple Pickup. Yeah. Um, so high level, what was the channel all about? Yeah, so it started off with like uh, my friends and I just trying to use pickup lines and mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to get girls' numbers. Um, but it turned into like a lot of different things like giving dating advice and sometimes we had porn stars come on and give sex advice. Um, so it was this, this like hodgepodge of just very, uh, very uh, 
kind of dating and relationships mm-hmm. in a fun uh, it, uh, dating and relationships packaged in a fun way. Hmm. So, um, what's kind of the most viral video from that channel? Like, how many views did you guys end up getting? So, the most viral video that we had on there was called um, "Fat Suit Fat Suit Tinder Date" or something mm-hmm. like that. I forgot what the, <laughs> the the channel shut down now because it's not on right. brand with what with what we want to be known as anymore, yep. but. Um, we had basically our friend Sarah, um, who's like, you know, this pretty cute girl, and um, we had her get some matches on Tinder. So that happened, and when they showed up for the Tinder date, she would be in this like really big fat suit with like makeup on, and she was like a completely completely different person. And so we did that, um, and then we also did the reverse for guys. So we had this guy Willie come on, you know, he's pretty fit. But when, when when the girl showed up, he had this big fat suit on, mm-hmm. and we you know we got people's reactions. So total, those videos got probably close to a hundred million views. Oh wow! Yeah. So what gave you the idea of starting this channel? Like, was it an entrepreneur kind of mindset? Like, let me start this channel, see how I can monetize. Tell us that backstory. Well. I always wanted to start my own business in college because I, I, I needed a way out. I was like, I can't do this anymore. This is just not, I'm not learning anything. And so I tried to start multiple businesses mm. and um, failed a couple of times. Yep. Um, and it wasn't until I read this article about how YouTubers get paid mm. that I said, hmm, there might be an interesting opportunity here. Right. right? Me going back to, to my early days, like I always try to take, a, take advantage of really great opportunities. And so... Um, I did that and it just, you know, after a few videos, we started getting some traction and that's Mm -hmm. when I said, hey, let's turn this into a full-fledged business. So I didn't just do that channel, but I created multiple channels too. Mm, Um, We have one called The Human Experiment, one called uh, Hacks of Life. Um, What else was there? Uh, The Random Altruist. So we were essentially like a media company Mm -hmm. that was creating a ton of different YouTube channels Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, selling our own products, getting advertising, uh, getting brands to pay us to, to, to promote their products too. So did you become a millionaire from that business? Yes. Yeah. You did? Yeah. Okay, so you got your first million from that business. Yeah. That is really cool, both you and your co-founder. Yep, yep, awesome. exactly. Um, how did that feel, like when you reached millionaire status? I mean, it felt, um, you know, being a millionaire was like a nice milestone. Mm-hmm. I think uh, leading up to that, what really, what felt really amazing for me wasn't really the money aspect. It was more of, hey, I can actually pay for whatever I need now. Like I can mm-hmm. go to take a trip to Europe, yep. have a nice dinner, you know, um, book a cruise or whatever it is, and not have to worry about it making a dent in my wallet. Mm-hmm. So I think the freedom is is really what what was uh, empowering, what was I fulfilling. See. And on top of that, I was able to provide for my family. As I mentioned, they grew, uh, you know, we grew up very poor. Yep. So there were many times where you know my parents had some type of accident at home and they couldn't pay for the repairs, mm-hmm. or my mom needed surgery and she didn't know how to pay it and she was in debt. And so all of these things, because I had money, like was no longer a problem. Right. I didn't have to stress about it anymore. And so going back to, to your question, it felt uh, empowering. It felt fulfilling, mm-hmm. right? Because my parents specifically, like they raised me my whole life. Right. And they gave everything to me. They worked fucking double shifts yep. and took care of me my entire life. And it, it felt um, very satisfying, very mm-hmm. gratifying to be able to give back to them like that. Oh, wow. That is that is an awesome story. Um, I know like... Asian parents particularly too, they, they will work like three jobs just to send you to college because they think that's like, I want to look after my, my kids and the next generation and, and so on. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, they were working their ass wow. off. That must have been awesome. Um, can you describe that moment like when, when you like were in the process or did you like, like buy, him, buy him a car? What happened? Like, yeah, I remember um, my mom was calling me, you know, when I left, when I, when I moved down, to, moved away from college, um, things didn't get, things started being pretty rough with my parents. Mm-hmm. You know, they're getting old, they're fighting all the time. And um, it just started getting worse and worse. And so a lot of it was money issues. Mm. And so I remember, you know, this was when I first started making some money. I wasn't like super rich or anything, but I, I was pretty well off. My mom's calling me and she says, you know, your dad and I fight all the time. And like most of the time it's about the car mm. because we only have one car. And um, we have to keep switching it off because I took their other car to go to college, <laughs> right? They gave it to me. Um, and she said, uh, it's because we keep having to switch off and now like we're at each other's throats. And I said, well, 
why don't I just buy you guys another car? Mm. And so um, they're like, what? Are you serious? Because this is when I first was doing YouTube and they had no clue what YouTube even was. Mm -hmm. They were like, what? So you make videos and put it on the internet? Are you sure that's going to be a good career for you? Yeah. <laughs> and so um, they were so surprised by that. And I just remember going car shopping with uh, my mom and she was just so happy that, that um, she, she didn't even care about what car she wanted. She was just wow. like, here, you pick. I'm just so happy because you're buying me a car. Um, and, and, you know, it was very gratifying. It, it felt really good to do that. So tell us, like, did you always envision yourself making a million dollars doing this business? Or what, what was dri the driving force? Obviously, kind of motivation to help your parents out. What other driving factors kind of went into it? And what was kind of your, your North Star goal? I think there's two things. One is definitely my parents. So uh, I, as I mentioned, I grew up poor. I knew what it was like uh, to, to not have money for just essential things. Um, you know, and then I also knew what it was like to have not have money for cool, fun things too. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember for Christmas, my mom, for two years in a row, my parents just gave me like a bag of candy for Christmas because that's all they could afford. And um, although I don't need any Christmas gifts, it's kind of demotivating as a child, right? When all of your friends are getting like games and PlayStation mm. and whatever it is. And it's like, oh, what did you get for Christmas, Kong? Oh, I got a bag of candy. And so it's, it's things like that that I grew up with that mm. really shaped my drive and my ambition to become successful. Um, so that's number one, just being able to provide for my parents and give them a better life, knowing all of the hard work and diligence that they put into taking care mm. of me and raising me. Um, number two is just not working for a, not working a nine to five job. Mm. So I've worked a few jobs in my life and, um, what kind of jobs? I was a tutor at this place called Kumon, mm -hmm. uh, when I was 15, that was my first job or 16, I forgot. That was my first job. Um, it was horrible. It was so terrible, but I needed, I needed to make money, mm -hmm. right? I needed to save up for college. And so um, I did that and it, I just hated it. I also worked at Starbucks. Mm. I worked at my school as a, uh, as a new student orientation leader. And, you know, there were fun parts about the job, don't get me wrong. Mm. Um, you know, I made some friends and, and had some good times there. But for the most part, like, I didn't want to do that for my mm. whole life. Yep. And I said, okay, so what am I doing here? I'm working this job to get paid so I can pay for college so that I can then get another job just like this that I then have to save up my money to to, to pay back my loans and I'm gonna have to do this my whole life. I didn't want that. You know, I can't stand monotony. I'm the type of person that needs things to be dynamic, needs things to be different every day. And so I just said, I made a commitment to myself that I'm not gonna do this, right? And mm. that's one of the reasons why I wanted to become an entrepreneur is um, I wanted for myself to be able to have the freedom yep. to do work on whatever I wanted. And number two, I wanted to be the person that creates a culture at my company where other people don't feel like they're trapped in a nine to five job. I see. Um, now fast forward, we're sitting here at Jump Cut HQ, 100 employees, your CEO. Um, did you ever think you would get to this point, building a, a massive company like this? And we've got you know a lot of years to come for you to scale things too, right? But to be honest, no, yeah. because um, my original goal was like, I just want to make like $100,000 a year and I'm going to mm -hmm. be set for life, right? <laughs> <laughs> Six I, figures, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, uh, it, it's what, it's it's weird. Maybe you can maybe you can talk a little bit about this too, but mm -hmm. there's just this drive in you as an entrepreneur to just right. do more and more and more. And yeah. it's not about the money, right? Like at, at one point I was, I, I'm still living the life. Like, uh, you know, I, I only need, I would say, uh, I think you asked me the other day, like, what's your, What's your fuck you money? My fuck you money is honestly like $150,000 a year. Like, you know, if I have that, it's yeah. like, I, I'm fucking living a luxurious life, yeah. man. I don't need more than that. Um, and that's already a lot. So right. anything more than that is just, you know, I save it up and, and, and I, I give it to my family. Um, so it's not about the money. It's about the impact. Um, mm -hmm. what, what really drives drove me to continue doing more is when we were doing Simple Pickup, yes, you know, we were doing these fun kind of like prank videos that, mm -hmm. that got people to, to laugh and be entertained. But at the core of it, the goal was to help people improve their lives, right? We, we, we wrapped it around these kind of like prank videos, but there were a lot of, uh, kind of videos we made called Simple Tips where mm -hmm. we would give people tips on how to become more social, how to become more mm -hmm. confident in yourself, mm -hmm. how to stop being so negative about your life and what, you know, all these disadvantages that you have. And, um, 
it really touched my heart when I would get emails from people saying like, hey, you've changed my outlook on life. I was mm -hmm. literally about to commit suicide and you know, you, you guys wow. helped me change my, my outlook and, and saved my life. And so knowing that you could do that to somebody, mm -hmm. knowing that a business can you know, not only provide you for a living and give you the freedom to live right. your life how you want, but that it could change other people's lives like that for, uh, in, a, in a positive way, that's just so powerful, man. And I, I just wanted more and more of that. Wow, absolutely. Um, I love that. So tell the audience where you actually came up with the idea for Jump Cut. Yeah, so um, at one point, you know, I was making a lot of YouTube videos, decent amount of money, good little lifestyle business, $2 million a year approximately with 80% just being profit. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was living the dream, you know, yeah. this was, it was fun. It was a dream job and we were getting paid for it. But um, as I mentioned, I wanted to do something more. Like I felt like, hey, I, I, I kind of reached my plateau with yeah with uh, the YouTube videos and I want to do something that's really going to help people like um, push push themselves to, to live a better life, to become a better person. And so I wanted to, to start a new company that, uh, that, that would do that. I so I searched for a very long time and um, I realized that the biggest opportunity here is I should just teach people how to do what I did mm -hmm. almost. So going back to my story from college, like, dude, I paid, I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars to get an education that was useless, right? right? And I ended up drop, dropping out, so it was very useless. And um, I said, well, what if we could do it better? What if we could invent a better college specifically for entrepreneurs, people who want to be an entrepreneur? Mm. Um, and the more I looked into it, the more I realized this was a huge opportunity because colleges um, are expensive and useless, unless you go to an Ivy League, like a Yale or a Harvard, then you're, you're set. Um, but for most people, you, you can't get accepted into that, right? For whatever reason. And so um, that whole system is just broken and I can go on and on about that. Absolutely. And so, uh, and then I looked at kind of the alternatives and uh, we saw that online education, with online ed education, the courses were good in terms of information, but it was just boring. <laughs> and me coming from a world of like making viral videos, I said, it, it, it was, the, the time I realized this was I was taking a course on After Effects. And um, for people that don't know, in the software After Effects, you, it's a special, sec, uh, special, sex, special effects <laughs> software <laughs> um, where you can literally like make things blow up right. and throw a fireball yep. out of somebody's hand. And uh, the guy teaching it was just so boring. Right. Like the entire course Very was like mundane. Incredible. Yeah. And I said, you know, you're teaching a course on how to use special effects. This should be pretty fun. I don't right. understand how this is boring. And I said, you know what? We're going to do this better. We're going to create a better online course experience mm. for people. And, uh, and on top of that, we're going to create a, a better college uh, experience too. I see. So at this point, I'm, I'm imagining, you know, you want to make bigger impact. You probably looked at, hey, should I bootstrap this company or should I go after venture capital? What was your decision process there? Because I want to also talk to the audience. You know, we both are YC alumni, Y Combinator, come from um, Summer Batch, yep. what, 16. Yep. But tell us that phase. Like, what, how'd you do that transition from lifestyle to uh, venture capital? So at the beginning of Jump Cut, we, we used our own money to, mm -hmm. to, to, to fund it. Um, so everything that I was making from my other business, I was mm -hmm like technically paying Jump Cut as a contractor, right? <laughs> to, to, to pay for the operations of, yeah. of, of this company. And so um, we did that for a while and we realized we just couldn't grow fast enough. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of things we wanted to do, but didn't have the money to do it. And mm -hmm. when we projected it out, it was like, all right, so we can save up and do this in like a year or two right. years. And so we said, look, to grow faster, if we really want to have a really big impact and grow as quickly as possible, we just have to get venture funding. Mm. Um, and that's when we decided to uh, start looking for, for funding. I see. Um, it was incredibly hard. Yep. And then <laughs> really, really hard to pitch to investors. And my friend was like, why don't you just go through Y Combinator? Because at the y end of Y Combinator, there's demo day yep. where you pitch to like 500 investors and right. whoever likes you is going to invest in you. So I was like, that sounds like a great idea. Mm -hmm. So we applied, got in, and uh, yeah, the fundraising after that was pretty easy. I see. Relative to before. So how long did you bootstrap for with Jump Cut? <sighs> about, about two years. Two years. Yeah, but Jump Cut originally was supposed to be, um, it was supposed to be something different. Oh, okay. Yeah, Tell us about that. Yeah, originally what Jump Cut was, was uh, we wanted to create a platform 
for, for creators and influencers to make money. Mm -hmm. So kind of like a hybrid between Patreon and, and let's say Patreon and like Teachable, mm. for example, something like that. Okay. So still teaching people how to like build their business, but right. creating the platform where they can do where that. They can launch it. Yeah, so we didn't start as an education company. We started as more of like a tech platform play. I see. Um, but uh, long story short, that didn't really work out. There were a lot of issues with it. And also my co-founder and I aren't technical, right? Like okay. we're not engineers. Yep. And so it was very hard for us to manage an engineering team and have the core product be that. Right. So coming from a non-technical background, which is important I think for the audience to mm -hmm. know is that this day and age, you don't have to be a technical founder to start a tech company. But I'm sure you ran into challenges. Did you hire a CTO or did you use an outsourcing shop? Dude, we tried to look for a CTO for like four years. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't find one, couldn't yeah. find one. Yep. And so, um, and, and also part of that is because I wasn't in Silicon Valley, right? I see. If you're around a lot of engineers and you work in San Francisco, you've yep. a big tech company, it's a lot easier. I was working in Los Angeles with a bunch of like, and I worked with influencers, right? right? I worked with a lot of video people. Yep. So that was my network. I didn't mm -hmm. even know an engineer. And so it was really, really hard for us to find somebody that, that, that we liked. It wasn't until actually about eight months ago that we, about eight months ago that we found somebody. I see. Yeah. So were you profitable with Jump Cut in those two years or no? I mean, t t technically no. So if you count the money that we were, that I was paying. From the other business. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, as, as yeah, a client. you were losing money. Then yeah, we were making money. But if you don't count that, we were losing a lot of money. Okay. And um, yeah, it wasn't until probably 2000 and s 2018 that we, that we were profitable. Excuse me. So um, before applying to YC, mm -hmm. um, how many investors did you pitch? We, were, we probably pitched like 20 investors, maybe like one per week. Because we, again, we didn't have the network, right? right? Like we, if you're in Silicon Valley and you know a lot of startup people, maybe yep. you can get introductions you can easily. And, yep. Yeah, but again, I knew a lot of film people, so mm -hmm. I couldn't get introductions to, to, to investors. So we had to like reach out to our like Silicon Valley network. It was really hard. Yep. Um, yeah, one so, per week was the average. Let's break down um, for the audience, Jump Cut. What, what was your elevator pitch going into YC? Back then, um, we didn't focus too much on like the whole business school part. We focused mm -hmm. on the online course part. We yep. said uh, um, our business pitch was essentially um, online courses that feel like movies. Mm, yeah, okay. so we wanted to essentially create online courses that were really beautifully made. And the end goal was to be able to like you know, like get Steven Spielberg or like J.J. Abrams to like right. direct an online course one day. <laughs> so that was the pitch that, that we pitched them. We're like, look, online courses right now are extremely boring. It's just like some person talking to the camera for five hours. Yep. We're going to make it a lot more entertaining. I see. And um, going into, well, let's talk about kind of the elevator pitch. So um, what was your moat or defensibility or magic sauce, if you will, you thought you had to go the venture capital route? Mm -hmm. um, so... To be honest, there was none. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the closest you can get with that business is, um, you know, like, oh God, what do they call it? There's, there's a word for it. But basically, you just have so much momentum that it's hard to catch up. Mm. It's like Netflix, right? What's right. their moat? Yep. Their moat is that they have a ton of content. They're making content way faster than anybody else. Right. Right. Um, First mover's advantage. Yeah, but that's not really a mo. Like right. hypothetically, not, somebody could yeah. just pour a billion dollars into <laughs> a new company and, and, and do the same thing. Um, but that was kind of like our pitch back then was that, you know, at one point we would just get to a point where we're going so fast that it's hard yep. to catch up. Now tell the audience, what's your elevator pitch, you know, fast forward 2019. Yeah, I think um, a lot has changed. So what we found was that our com originally, we were measuring completion rate. How many people completed an online our online course? Mm -hmm. So the industry average is about ten percent, and we uh, had sixty five percent, right? Because we made our courses extremely yeah. captivating, very entertaining. Yep. Um, but what we found is that while people were finishing the course, they weren't doing the assignments. Mm. They weren't doing like only about ten percent of people actually did all of the assignments. Mm -hmm. And so we realized pretty quickly that uh, the, the, the completion rate was, was a vanity metric, right? Mm. Um, it doesn't really mean anything. Like just because people watched it doesn't mean they're gonna be successful. And at the end of the day, we didn't wanna build an entertainment company. Right. We wanted to build a school. And so um, we kind of moved things around and, and started to focus more on assignments and success mm -hmm. rather than uh, just the completion rate. So um, the pitch now, though, is that you know we, our our um, 
the main metric that we want to measure is success. Mm. So how many people actually uh, actually become successful? And successful meaning you know they start a business that's making over a hundred thousand dollars a year. I see. Um, and so uh, we're still building the infrastructure to get there. But the way it works now is that one, we have the online course, yep. which gets people to get in the door and to start their business. You know, that's a scalable way to do that. So you can. That's the first layer. Then we take the best students from that online course and we put them in a uh, fellowship. So mm. we created like a Y Combinator I see. for small yeah. business, you know, for the micro entrepreneur. And that gets them to get to the next level and actually become successful. And so our success rate right now, based on the small cohort that we did with this fellowship, is uh, about 50%. So 50% of people who s go into the fellowship mm -hmm. come out with a successful business oh, making wow. over $100,000 a year. Wow, that is really good. Yeah. Um, so if you're meeting an investor at a coffee shop or a friend or and you say, hey, what's, what's Jump Cut? How would you explain that right now? Yeah, I would probably, uh, I would say um, Jump Cut's a school for entrepreneurs. Um, we teach people how to start their, their, their business via online course. Mm -hmm. And then we put them through a uh, fellowship or a boot camp to uh, accelerate or an accelerator mm -hmm. because the investors know what accelerators are. Yep. We put them through an accelerator um, to, to get them successful and we take 7% of their revenue. Okay, nice. Um, so Jump Cut, how much have you guys raised up so far, up to date? So we raised about 1.75 million in uh, 2016, right after Y Combinator. And um, we were able to become profitable after uh, a couple of years. So oh, we wow. haven't raised anything since. We're actually raising our next round right now. <laughs> yep, in the middle of it right yep, now. Yep, exactly. Um, so raised a seed round, 1.75 million, uh, reached profitability within what, two years from yep. YC? Yep. Summer 16, that's, yep. that's awesome. Um, let's talk about like briefly for the audience, like. Were you were you consciously planning out your runway, your team, your build out? Like like when you got that money, like like how did you end up using that money? Like how did you break it out? Like and did it go as planned? It definitely didn't go as planned. I don't <laughs> think anything ever does. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the way we broke it out was we said okay. Um, I think for the first year we just needed to, a, a model that worked. So back then we were we were like a we were a subscription, right? We were yep. like Netflix for education type okay. of thing. So it was seventeen dollars a month, oh, and wow, um, yeah, very cheap. And um, we just saw that people were unsubscribing like crazy because when you mm. make a subscription, um, you have to keep putting in content. Otherwise, people are gonna watch the course and be like, I don't. I don't need this anymore. Right. And because we wanted our courses to be high quality, mm -hmm. we couldn't keep up with that quantity, like you know, the, that quantity uh, release schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we spent a good amount of time not even spending the money <laughs> and mm -hmm. just trying to figure out our business model and paying for like oh, the small team that we had. It wasn't until probably a few months after YC that we said, okay, why don't we just flip this whole thing upside down? Mm -hmm. And we decided, hey, let's sell this course for $1,000. Because yep. our best customers, um, the ones that loved it the most, said, I would gladly pay $1,000 for this. And so we did that so that, one, um, we only get people who are really serious to come in, and therefore the community is better. And then number two is that uh, it solves the churn issue of $17 per month. People unsubscribe after they watch it. Right? I see. And um, it just did really, really well. The conversion rate was very s similar, if not the same, to actually when we were doing $17 a month. Wow. Yeah. Without the worry about churn and yeah. canceling. Exactly, IC. exactly. So um, back then, going into YC, how big was your team? Well, we were in YC, I think the team was 10 people. 10 people. Yeah, something okay. like that. So you're 10x now, right? Fast yep. forward three years. Yep. Um, how much revenue were you doing in 2016? 2016, we did four hundred thousand dollars in revenue, and that's off the subscription model. Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. yeah. And then once you switched, um, how much did you do? Let's say in 2017. 2017, we did four million dollars in revenue. Wow, four yeah. million. And then 2018. 2018, we did uh, twelve point five million in revenue. Whew. So huge growth, and you can see that once something you figure out, like Kong says, you figure out a model that works. Venture capital is used to kind of help you scale things out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. And one thing too that I realized about venture capital is, you know, when you're when you're a profitable company, let's say you want to keep growing, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to save money and put that in the bank, right? Because our our rule is you always, we should always have twelve months of runway right. in the bank, and we tried to do that with our our own money in around two thousand eighteen. Um, so we saved 
I forgot how much. It was like a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, and what happened is the government comes and takes 40% of that, right? Or at, the, at that time, it was, it was 40%. Right. Either way, they take a percentage of it. And so if you, like, basically, if you save money, the government takes some. <laughs> but if you raise money, that's not taxable. They don't take any of that. Mm. And so obviously you give up the equity, but now you have a lot more capital to work with and you don't yep. have to worry about paying off the government every single year. Right. And so that's one big advantage that I honestly actually didn't even think about until we had to pay, you know, like $200,000, $300,000 in taxes. Wow, that's a great insight. Um, yeah. They call it also getting dry, more dry powder. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so um, let's jump into maybe from 2016, kind of fast forward to now, what's kind of the biggest mistakes you, you've made while building the company Yeah, in, in hindsight? I think just um, focus and prioritization mm. is probably the latest mistake that, that we made. So last year, 2018, um, you know, end of 2017, we, we, we figured out how to run ads, how to run video ads. And we said, hey, this is making us so much money, let's just keep pouring fuel onto the fire. Mm -hmm. And um, we did that knowing that our long-term goal wasn't to make courses. We wanted people to become successful. But we kind of lost sight of that because we found this thing that was working was just making a ton of money. Right. It wasn't until this year that um, you know, a couple of things happened that we had uh, some rocky months. Um, I won't get into it, but things that were just kind of out of our control. And um, we had to do a lot of bandaging, a lot of like mm. triage and fixing things. And it got us to think, man, what, I and, the, and, and it got us to think like this business of selling courses, mm. it's always going to be up and down, right? And um, if we keep trying to play this game of like improving revenue, improving revenue, improving revenue, there's just going to be so much variability to it. And, and on top of that, we really, uh, we kind of started thinking about 10 years from now, we said, and these courses are getting people in the door and some people are getting successful, but it's not getting the success rates that we want. Right. And so we started to shift our focus and said, you know what, forget the money aspect. Let's just focus now on the success. And so that's why we decided to now raise another round of funding mm -hmm. so that we can say, look, who cares about the courses? Eventually yep. we're just gonna make them free. Like everybody can take these courses for right. free. What we want to focus on is the fellowship because that's actually what's going to get people to become successful. Wow. Um, no, it completely resonates with me because, you know, as I just last year closed a, a Series A, mm -hmm. we were really focused on growing top line revenue and, you know, you can get trapped. Like yep. it's a CEO trap. Like when you get a ton of money, VCs, the board will expect you to grow that top line, but it might not really align with your true like mission or yeah, what yeah. you want to do, mm -hmm. right? So that really resonates. Um, as we, at our company, NextGenT, we shifted our top goal strategy of this, you know, revenue number to, no, let's get, you know, X amount of students into jobs and, you know. For, yeah, exactly. And that's that's kind of like what you're, you know, saying with your courses now. It's like focusing on the results. So that's really empowering. And I think, I think the main thing too is that you have to figure out, okay, so what's the mission? What's the end goal for you? Um, what's the vision of the company? And then how, what's the best way to get there? Yep. And then how do you actually create a business model around that? I love I that. I think that's kind of what we, what we didn't do before because we're like, well, we know how to get people successful. Right. We just don't know the business model yet. Right, like, and we were playing around with some ideas and we we're like, oh, well, it's gonna take like, you know, a few months to test this out to see if yep. it works. Um, and we did test it out, but we just did it at a small scale. You know, we only put 25 people through the fellowship or 24 mm. people. Okay. So, um, so uh, at this point, because we force ourselves, because we're going out to raise, we're yep. forcing ourselves to figure out what is the best model for this. And I think we came up with something pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, but that's only because we prioritize this and said, look, we have to make this work. Mm. Wow, love it. Um, so one thing that I like to really share with um, my audience is the framework around success and like building your company and dream, believe, create, execute, and focus. And I'm just curious, Kong, like in that framework, you know, you've dreamt of this, you know, company, this, this company, and it seems like this dream is getting bigger and bigger mm -hmm. year over year, right? Yeah, yeah. But you have to believe in it in order for you to start executing. Mm -hmm. um, when did you have that kind of like more conviction, like believing it and like, wow, this is really working? What, can you share any of those moments? Um, I think I believed on it in, in it pretty early on. Um, just back in the YouTube days when people were 
you know, emailing us saying like we changed their lives. Yep. That's when I believed that. I guess I could make a difference. Mm. And I guess uh, if you're talking about Jump Cut in particular, um, I think I believed when we changed our business model to uh, to subscription to the thousand, the thousand dollars. Yeah, mm. because we got a lot of people who because when we were doing seventeen dollars a month, we got a lot of like trolls. Yep. Who would come in and be like, yeah. wow, this fucking sucks, <laughs> or whatever, Kong's ugly. Uh, I don't know. Like, whatever you see in the YouTube comments, like, yep. that was the community. Mm -hmm. And changing it to $1,000, you got the people who were really serious. And right. people started um, uh, not only being nicer to every, not you, you only got the people who were nice to everybody, mm -hmm. who wanted to support everybody. And then on top of that, people tried harder mm. because they paid $1,000. Right. 17, you're like, eh, whatever. It's a couple of cup, cups of coffee. $1,000, that's a lot of money, right? right? And it's like, look, you, you better, we have a refund policy of 365 days. If you do all the assignments and you don't mm. like the course, give you your money, give, we give you your money back. Mm. But if you don't do the assignments, then I'm not, like, we're not responsible for anything because you didn't try. Yep. Right, and it's very easy to do the assignments. It's not hard, and so um, you got a lot of people who were very serious about the program, and therefore more success stories as well. I see. So that's when I really believed in it. Awesome. Um, now, and then on top of that, it it actually made us more money as a business too. So it's weird <laughs> how that works out, right? Like yep. what's better for the product and what's better for kind of results right. is like also translated into being better for the business yeah. overall. It makes sense. The money kind of take takes care of itself, yep. so to speak because you're providing way more value to your audience and yeah. your customers. Now, fast forward, 100 employees. Let's break down the 100 employees real quick um, You know, for the audience. Mm -hmm. um, how, how's the structure? Like, how many people in ops, engineering, customer success, video, so, roughly? Roughly, we have about 50 people in uh, customer service mm -hmm. um, because we, do, we have a lot of free content out there. And a lot of times people you know, ask questions about can I get help with this? Or, you know, what do you mean by when you say this? So we, we have people kind of helping them out and making sure that uh, that they're okay. Um, it's not like we give like super personalized advice, but mm -hmm. we do give some support in that in, the, in that area. Um, so that's f about 50. We have about 10 people in operations just mm -hmm. doing like accounting, you know, um, logistical planning, um, you know, the all hands meeting, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, onboarding. About 10 people in operations. We have... Uh, uh, 15 people now in engineering. Oh, wow. Yeah, 15 in engineering. What is that? Is that 85? 85. And then I would say, let's call it five people on like the executive team that's right. leading Management. different, yeah, that's yep. leading different uh, departments. And then um, we have uh, five people on, on, on the ads team running right. our ads. Okay. And then also... Um, the video crew probably. Yeah, then video crew is about uh, 10 people. Okay. So I'm not sure that that might not add up to a hundred. Okay, but give or take. <laughs> yeah, you know, give or plus or yeah, plus or minus yep. like ten percent on all of those numbers. Awesome. Yeah. Um, what's the hardest thing you've encountered building and scaling the company? You know, from when it was just two of you guys to now a hundred employees. I think the hardest thing, the hardest thing I've encountered is. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you something from the, from like the early days. Um, one of the hardest things that were that that was uh, really difficult for me was delegating, right? Because you're very used to, especially when I was making YouTube videos, mm. and it's like, look, I know how to edit, I know how to direct, I know how to like be on camera, I know how to do all these things, and to give that up and say like, mm -hmm. all right, this team, you're you're gonna you're hired to do it better than me. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard because I wanted to to be in control of that. And mm -hmm. so um, I think it wasn't until, uh, you know, it wasn't until about a year in that uh, I, my, my co-founder talked to me and said, look, you're taking on way too much. Like, you can't, you can't handle this. And things are slipping through the cracks. You need to start delegating and just let people do their shit. Um, and if they can't do it well, mm -hmm. then we have to let them go and find somebody who can. Yep. And so what had that happened is we ended up having to let some people go, right? Because mm -hmm. what I realized is that we had people who couldn't do it better than me. And if you can't do it better than me, right. then I can't trust you with it. And so um, I think half of the people we had at that time were really good and did it better than me. Yep. And we're really glad that they got the, the responsibility. Um, there were a couple of people that, that couldn't. And unfortunately, you know, we had to let them go and hire somebody to take their place. Oh, wow. I mean, a lot of golden nuggets there right there, Kong. Yeah. Um, you shared is one, like you need to delegate as you scale the company, right? Yep. And um, the CEO kind of duties really evolve. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You would say right over the years, it's mm -hmm. evolved a lot. Um, 
And I always say go by the same rule. Like if if I hire someone and this person can can't do the job better than me, I I, I let them go. Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. You want to hear hire rock stars, right? Can that can do the job better than you? Exactly. I think I think your job as a CEO is a, is supposed to be like just be a really good generalist. You know, mm-hmm. get pretty decent at doing everything. Yep. Or good at doing everything. But you're not going to be the best, right? right? To be the best, you have to like just spend all of your time doing that. Yep. And as a CEO, you just can't do that. Um, so uh, if they're not better than you and they're doing it full time, then that says something about you know sure. the, the, the 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 talent that that you're hiring. Yep. Now talk about uh, since you know now you're running a hundred person company. What's your week look like? Like, and what do you? What's kind of the primary focus that you know you focus in? So, I think Brian Chesky from Airbnb uh, said it best. He said his his job changes every three months, mm-hmm. and I think it's the same with me too. So right now I'm fundraising a lot. Right. Okay. Um, we're we're just about to end, but um, I've been I've been focusing a lot on that. Um, we're trying to redo our branding and marketing. So I'm now stepping in to uh, the, we don't, we've never really had like a VP of marketing mm-hmm. um, or a CMO. Yep. So I'm actually stepping into that role right now mm. to make sure everything is aligned in terms of branding, message, ads, all that stuff. Um, building out the team. Um, I'm working with my co-founder as well, but you know, making sure the logistical stuff's there, building out the team, building out the processes. And um, the goal here is by the next you know, few weeks, we'll hire a CMO who's better than me mm-hmm. to replace me in that. But that's what I'm mostly spending my time on right now is um, really kind of whipping into shape this all of our marketing teams because they're kind of being isolated right now in different teams. I'm getting them all to work as one now. Um, I see. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. Um, now you're doing like a brand reboot. You've been probably thinking about the vision of the company, where you want to kind of take it. Yep. It, Tell the audience, like, what's the vision of Jump Cut, let's say, 10, 20 years out, like, really out there? You know, what do you vision? Um, I want to be the best business school in the world. Mm. So uh, definitely the best entrepreneurship school in the world. So the, the goal here is that we have different tracks for different types of entrepreneurs. Um, and we still do the kind of, like, mentorship, Y Combinator, you know, even, uh, uh, like, coding boot camp model where you take this thing for three months, you yep. s- b- build your business, we take a percentage, and uh, you know that's what we're known at. We're, we're known as a school for entrepreneurs. But 20 years down the line, we want to be teaching other skills too because these entrepreneurs are going to need to hire teams. Right. right? So we can teach people like recruiting. We can teach people how to do pivot tables on Excel, something mm-hmm. as simple as that. Um, we can teach people how to do marketing on, on Facebook and Google and SEO and all that stuff. So... We want to be essentially what business school should be today. Because business school doesn't teach you shit, yeah. right? It's like, <laughs> it really doesn't teach you anything. Even if you look at like Stanford's uh, curriculum, some of the classes might be useful. Actually, there's a handful of classes that are useful, but most of them are just not. It's not, it's not something that is going to be used in, in the real world. And I, need, I think somebody needs to create something that replaces that so that people can actually get trained to, and be ready for the world of business. Right. I mean, at our company, we like to really focus on job readiness training, and Mm -hmm. it's practical skills training. I think entrepreneurship, um, correct me if I'm wrong, like what your insight is probably telling me is that you believe that also entrepreneurship is like building like real stuff and then applying it and doing it and like really learning in on the job, right? Versus like six, seven, eight years in, in trying to get your MBA. Exactly. I think it's a little bit of both. So, so there's definitely like a kind of like skills aspect to it mm-hmm. with with entrepreneurship like let's say you know one of the things that we're going to teach is how to start your own facebook ads agency mm. right so as an entrepreneur you can start your own marketing agency well you need to learn how to use facebook you need to learn the like strategies behind it and learn how to think about it right yeah but actually like getting clients managing clients signing contracts hiring lawyers you kind of got to learn that on the job yep. so i think it's a mixture of both nice um, what's some secrets or insights that you could share with the audience in in building jump cut I would say the biggest insight I had was, so two things. Um, I think the, the biggest mistake that founders make, like literally every single founder, mm-hmm. is not, is not uh, letting people go fast enough, mm. right? Um, yep, I've had yeah, that mistake. Yeah, in, exactly. <laughs> like in a business, yeah. you're inevitably going to make wrong hires, right? Yep. There's some people who are just really good at interviewing, like super on point, and then they get out of the job and they kind of let you down. No results. Yeah, and so... Um, 
being able to uh, to spot that quickly mm. and let them go is, uh, you know, as as um, who was it? Uh, CEO of LinkedIn, the old CEO of LinkedIn, um, Jeff Weiner. Jeff Weiner. Mm. I can't remember. It's not Reed Hoffman. Jeff yeah, Weiner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, the, I think he puts it best. He said um, the way that uh, when you fire somebody uh, quickly, that's actually the more compassionate thing to do, mm. because sure. if you know they're not doing well at their job, like, and you you know that, everybody else on the team knows that, right? Yep. Then you know that the person knows that, and now people are you know feeling discouraged because there's this, this one person who's not pulling their weight. You're feeling discouraged because you're like, ah, oh, no, I should like they're not they're not really that good. We can find somebody better, and then they're discouraged too because they know that they're not doing a good job, and they bring that back to their family, bring that back to their friends, bring that negative energy back. Mm. Um, and it's better for them to just find something that they do fit in, right? For sure. Like just because they don't fit in in your organization, it doesn't mean they can't thrive at another organization. Absolutely. And so by not letting them go, um, you're actually being like by letting them go quickly. That's the compassionate thing to do for everybody. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of the way I think about it now. Now, do you have an exit plan? Actually, la- last well, thing is um, <laughs> Sam Altman said something funny uh, at, at one of the YC meetings. He was like, he was like, if you're thinking that you need to fire somebody, you got to just do it. I've do never, it. yeah, and he said, I've never heard an entrepreneur say, I fired someone too soon. He was like, in my entire year of, yep. enti- entire years of running YC, I've never heard an entrepreneur say, I fired somebody too soon. Oh, wow. Which is really, really uh, eye-opening for me. So for me, I ask my question. This is the one question I ask, and it, it helps me determine now moving forward if I need to let go of someone is, well, do I want to clone this person? And if I say yes, then this is a keeper. Oh, that's good. And yeah. if I say no, that means there are some issues. That's a good framework. <laughs> that's a good framework. Do you want to clone this person? Do you want to clone, yeah, this, you person? Want to clone yeah. this person? Do you want a hundred of this person <laughs> going around, right? Because you're yeah. rock stars. Yeah. You, would, you would absolutely clone them. They're, yeah. You know? Of course. They're like so important yep. to helping you build a business, right? Yeah. Um, I think you shared with me kind of like a vision of the company, but if you were to kind of say, what's the new mission at Jump Cut that you would share with, you know, new employees, new investors? What's that mission? Um, the mission is to, to make uh, entrepreneurship education available to the masses mm-hmm. and to provide the best you know, program in the world and uh, give, give them the highest chance of success. Love um, it. Yeah, that's really what it is. Awesome. Um, do you have an exit plan for a jump cut? Um, I don't necessarily have a plan. I don't think you can really plan that out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the biggest thing that I'm looking for is, um, tr- uh, you know, going back to the mission, trying to, to create as many success stories as possible. And when we do that, then kind of more doors open. So, mm. you know, people might want to acquire you. Um, I don't necessarily want to do that, but mm-hmm. I'll always take a look at whatever is being offered. Right. Um, but I think if I had to choose one that I want to, yep. it would be to IPO, right? IPO. Going, okay. Growing so fast that you just need more money from, from uh, that, that you're able to IPO and, and, and raise more money from kind of institutional investors and uh, eventually, like that would be the exit strategy. I yeah. see. So this is a company that you want to do for the lifetime, for at least the un- unforeseeable future, it seems like. Is that is that correct? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, I think at one point, I definitely want to start a nonprofit. Um, that's kind of been my goal for a very long time. But this is definitely what is in my uh, sight for the foreseeable future. Okay, awesome. Um, now, any last advice for those young, maybe first-time entrepreneurs, maybe even second, third time, uh, that you'd like to give, you know, as they're starting their um, company? Yeah. Um, so the first thing is going back to just hiring and firing. Um, if somebody's not working out, let them go early. That's the compassionate thing to do. But uh, on the hiring side, be very, 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 very strict on who you let go, or not who you let go, on who you bring on, right? Because um, that, if you can screen properly and if you can, can filter through all of the kind of uh, bad people, then when you bring on the great people, it's just gonna make your life so much easier. So I would say put a very, very strong emphasis on hiring the right people, that's number one. And then number two is, um, is uh, 
pay attention to your mental health. So this is something that I, I really struggled with before. I think a lot mm, of entrepreneurs struggle with. Sure. Um, it wasn't until I went through this uh, this uh, kind of founders retreat uh, that replicates actually a, a class from Stanford Business School, school called Touchy Feely um, or Interpersonal Communication. And it talks about how you should be vulnerable, how you should share your emotions. Because I used mm. to think that a good leader is just like a rock. Like you're just like, you never, you're never phased by anything. You're never hurt. You're never sad. You're always happy. You're always on point. And that's not the case, right? Um, a good leader is somebody who can actually share the times that uh, they're feeling sad or depressed. They can share the times when they're feeling stressed out. They can share the times when they're feeling frustrated. And they can share the times when they're, they feel grateful and, and, and fulfilled and happy. And so, um, you know, that led me down this kind of huge path of, of this long path of mental health. And since then, you know, I've got an executive coach. Um, I, uh, I have a therapist. Um, and then also I rely very heavily on kind of my support group to, or my support group of entrepreneurs to, to make sure that we're keeping each other accountable and we're, we're kind of there for each other emotionally. So it seems like a very, you know, um, uh, let's say touchy feely thing mm -hmm. to do, but man, it's going to do wonders because being, a, being an entrepreneur is, is it's a, it's a very, um, it's a tough road, right? There's very high highs and when you're there, it's great. It's fantastic. But there's very low lows too. And if you don't have the proper support mechanisms in place, um, it'll drive you crazy. So I would say definitely pay attention to your mental health. Wow, those are some really great tips, Kong. Um, really appreciate it. Definitely resonate with both of them. One book that comes to mind when you're talking about letting go of people is like good to great. They say building, a, you know, from Jim Collins, he said like you have to make sure like you have the right people on the bus mm -hmm. and like the bus can only fit so many people. Yep. And if you don't, you need to get people off the bus so you can get the right people on the bus until it's like the perfect people on the bus. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I get it. And, and we actually started doing Founders Retreat quarterly, me and my co-founder. And we're just like, we talk about all the great uh, successes, but we also are vulnerable. Like, you know, just showing our emotions on like what we're sad about or what we're, what's not working, what's like keeping us up late at night, things like that. Yeah, that's so, great. Um, I, I could definitely resonate with that. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yep. Well, that's it. Appreciate it, Kong. Uh, thank you for sharing with our audience your story. Any last things you want to say before we wrap it up? Um, if you want to learn how to be an entrepreneur and start your own YouTube channel, go to jumpcut.com and uh, you can go through our free course. And if you like it, you can buy our course for $1,000 after that. And if you don't, totally okay too. There you have it, guys. Well, thanks, Kong. Appreciate it. Me. Yep. Favorite book? The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. Very great management book. Uh, favorite color? Black. <laughs> Technically, that's not a color, but you know. Favorite movie? Requiem for a Dream. Yeah, that was a great one. After I watched that, I couldn't mm -hmm. clench my fist because I was just so weak. <laughs> favorite podcast? I really love Joe Rogan, honestly. Joe Rogan? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like a guilty pleasure, but uh, I just love that guy. Yep. Productivity-wise, probably Tim Ferriss. And then entertainment-wise, probably Science Versus. It's a Gimli, Gimli podcast. Let me let me go back. My favorite podcast mm -hmm. is actually called An Unconventional Life. It's a jump cut podcast that we oh. just started. <laughs> There's a plug-in. Boom. All right, boom. <laughs> favorite entrepreneur. In terms of visionary, like just yeah. Elon Musk. I think an underrated one is uh, Jeff Wiener. As, okay. I hope I'm saying his name right yeah. i hope it's not like wine <laughs> yeah Got the it. linkedin ceo he really opened my mind to like this idea of compassionate leadership mm. right not being like a douchebag and yelling at people right, but right. actually being compassionate with people yep. and um and leading that way so i i all, all his talks are great i really love them